Hello, and welcome to another Securities Lending Live on Saturdays with PurePoint. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel, and today we're going to be talking about regulations for securities lending. This is the second of a two-part series. Thanks for joining me. For anyone else that comes in, feel free to let me know where you are watching from. I'm always interested to know because we get quite a wide global a network of people watching us. So I'm just going to line up the slides so that you can walk through them with me. Don't forget that you can download the slides separately. So if you go to this link here in uh, bit.ly slash SL fundamentals, you can sign up, receive previous episode slide decks and all the slide decks going forward. So don't forget to uh, sign up for that. If you're interested in getting the slides, let me just share my screen momentarily. I hope uh, everyone's uh, enjoying their, their Saturday and their weekends. This is the rainiest Saturday we've had in a long time after a great week of weather. So I don't feel quite as bad being in front of you today as I did last Saturday, which was, uh, which was very quiet. Uh, Steven, thanks uh, very much for joining us. Good to see you here. Appreciate you, you popping by. And so Gandika, thanks again for coming through and watching us today. Let me just put the slides up. Hopefully you can see that in a second. And there we go. So here we are, regulations part two. Let's get into it and we'll go straight to it. If we just get onto the slides. Here we go. So last week we talked about regulations part one there. We were mostly focused on short selling and the LCR, the liquidity coverage ratio. And the reason we focused on those two issues was they were very much on the demand side. So regulations that affect the amount of short selling activity or the need for a high quality liquid asset government bond borrowing they affect the volume of activity. So we focused on demand last week. Uh, this week, we're going to take another look at it. And as it says there, next week, we'll be looking at uh, securities lending in times of crisis. So I'll focus on a couple of uh, crisis moments over the past sort of uh, 10, 20, 30 years and talk about what happened in securities lending. So I hope you can join me for that one. Okay. Today, the three or four, in fact, five different regulations we're going to talk about very briefly is the financial transaction tax. And then so the combination of Basel III and uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, because there's some overlap, they're different regulations, but there is overlap in objective and impact on the business. Number three, we're going to talk about CSD. And number four, we're going to do a couple of slides on SFTR. Right, so it's alphabet soup day today. Nothing but alphabets and acronyms here, and let's just get to it. As always with these videos, I hope I hope you enjoy them. I hope this uh, gives you information that you find valuable and useful. If so, give me a thumbs up. I, I we're trying to get out to as many people as possible. We're trying to spread the word about this business, and if you give us the thumbs up then that helps us do that. If you're interested in getting future videos, obviously subscribe and also ring the bell so you get notified as and when we post videos. <clears throat> right, financial transaction tax. What is it? It's a specific kind of a tax that has been brought in for a very specific reason and it's very focused on a particular type of financial transaction. So for an exchange or buying and selling securities. So an FTT, which uh, has existed for a long time, but we'll talk about uh, a couple of examples in a minute. But one of the things that uh, really annoyed me, quite frankly, is in the aftermath of the Lehman default and the global financial crisis in 2007 to 2009, the reality is a lot of politicians used financial transaction tax, in my opinion, for political purposes to voters excited about the fact that they were going to put a penalty on financial institutions, the banks that they had to bail out. And while I'm not arguing that banks had to be bailed out, because clearly many of them did, the reality is this tax is not a tax on those financial institutions. What it is, is a tax 
on you. It's a tax on retail investors. It's a tax on pension funds. It's a tax on mutual funds and usits. It's, an, it's a tax on ETFs. Anyway, it's a tax on buyers and sellers of securities, not the intermediaries collect it, but it's not a tax on them. It's a tax on you. So the two most recent examples that I want to talk about because they have a specific impact with respect to securities lending is France, which in August of 2012 brought in a tax on uh, trading in large capitalization stocks and high frequency trading. And so what they're trying to do is <clears throat> discourage activity in terms of high frequency trading. High frequency trading involves uh, very active trading as the name suggests but very high turnover. And the truth is a tax on those sorts of trading uh, activities will reduce the amount because it takes such a big proportion of the profit. So there's a formula for calculating what constitutes high frequency trading, but the objective is to reduce it. Uh, Italy brought in a similar tax, again, on large cap Italian stocks, but they also brought in a tax on equity derivative contracts as well as high frequency trading. So that's the difference between Italy and France is that uh, France didn't bring in that tax on derivatives, whereas Italy did. Okay, now there's all kinds of reasons why. I'm certain it's just a coincidence that there's a very high proportion of, of French people that are leaders in the uh, equity derivative industry. I don't know whether that's me drawing some kind of conspiracy theory, but it is factually correct that France didn't put in a tax on equity derivatives. And there is a huge proportion of French people working in the equity derivative industry. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. <clears throat> Now, securities finance transactions, securities lending, repo, and similar sorts of trades are generally exempt from this tax, right? Because politicians have recognized and regulators have recognized that these functions don't involve transfer of ownership. And so they should be exempted from that. And they help smooth operational flows as well as assist in financing and liquidity for markets. <clears throat> so they're generally exempt. So why do I care? Why am I even talking to you about it? It's because the impact on trading, which therefore includes short selling and therefore includes lending, and also reduces the amount of long buying, which then needs to be asset financed through repo transactions. All of that affects the volume of activity in the market. So what's the impact of the FTT? Um, in the two examples I give here is for France. These are both from a study that was released about a year after the financial transaction taxes applied to both markets. And what they found was that the bid ask spread, that's the difference between what a market maker will buy a stock for and sell a stock for. So if you want to sell it, you have to uh, see what they're willing to bid. And if you want to buy it from them, you see what price they're asking for it and it's widened. So what widening on a bid ask spread means is that for uh, buyers, they're having to pay more and for sellers, they're getting lower proceeds. So it makes it less profitable for investors in terms of their investment returns. So that's the, that's the issue. So widening by 75 basis points, three quarters of a percent is actually a really big figure. These large cap stocks will trade very narrowly, just a handful of basis points. So a 75 basis point difference will, will have a big impact. More importantly, the volume re relative to the untaxed French stocks fell by 24%. So not only was it more expensive to trade in the assets, the number of trades actually reduced pretty dramatically. Italy saw a, a similar outcome with even wider spread and then slightly lower volumes. And that'll probably be because the number of uh, large cap stocks in France probably exceeds the, the equivalent amount in, in Italy. So a uh, big impact there, more expensive to trade, less trading, therefore less short selling. And the bottom line is that the securities lending market impact is that investors generated lower returns for their Italian and French portfolios. Okay, so that's the real life impact of this. 
right? And it's real, right? And that has continued. Now, I haven't found whether there is a, another, another study that's been done subsequent to that. I've searched for it. I haven't found any. If anyone sees one or knows, of, knows where I can find one, please uh, feel free to maybe put it in the comments below. I'm always interested in learning more. So that's a financial transaction tax, a tax that doesn't apply to the business, but impacts the business. Oh, hold on, just go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Basel III and Dodd-Frank. Okay, and while we're doing that, if you want to pop into the notes below, into the comments, tell me where you're watching from. I can see that uh, there's been people from, from the UK, from somewhere in Asia, which I can't identify, and uh, can my old friend Jean-Pierre. So great to see you guys. Thanks very much for being here. Basel III and Dodd-Frank, what are they? <clears throat> so they're two, first of all, they're two different regulations. One is the Basel III is a global one, and the Dodd-Frank Act is a U.S. one. But there's a lot of areas that overlap, and there's a lot of areas in both of those regulations. It covers a really broad spectrum of activities and treatment of businesses and balance sheets and capital um, allocations. So what I'm just focusing on here are the, the couple of areas where there's an overlap for securities finance transactions. Now, the other difference between Basel III and Dodd-Frank Act is that Basel III is a global regulation, but it needs to be implemented country by country. So you'll see individual countries work on their own schedules as to when it will affect the banks in their jurisdiction. And so to the extent that historically there have been issues with some countries delaying the implementation of it, maybe gaming the system a little bit, because generally the regulations constrain what banks can do and how they can do it. So if my country implements it later than another country, then that effectively give, gives my banks or banks in my country an advantage. I think that was the case more historically. I think we get more timely implementation of these Basel regulations these days. So I just want to say hi to a couple of people from, from India. So that's, uh, that's Olga and uh, apologies if I mispronounce this, but Pruth Viraj from India. So thanks for both recent contacts of mine on LinkedIn. Appreciate you signing on and joining me and Andrew, great to see you joining us from, uh, from London. Thanks for stopping. Getting back to the regulations. So Basel three implemented country by country. The U.S. regulation, Dodd-Frank Act, obviously only implemented by one country and easier to implement in the sense of getting the rule passed, and it was in, in, installed in uh, 2010. Now, what are the two areas of impact here? One is that both regulations effectively limited the amount of proprietary trading by banks. What do I mean by proprietary trading by banks? That means that they're buying or selling assets and actually taking a risk position. So if they buy an asset and it goes up, the bank makes money. If they buy an asset and it loses money, the bank loses money. So they're very active. And that also applies on the short side. If they take a short position and the uh, asset price drops, they profit. If they take a short position and the asset price rises, then obviously they lose money on that. Now. Both rules wanted less activity by banks. They, they say banks are there to facilitate client business, but you're not really there to take proprietary trading positions. And so many people talk about it as if it's been prohibited. That's not technically correct. You can still do proprietary trading. They just make it so expensive from a capital point of view that people don't really do it very actively. <clears throat> now, when I talk about client facilitation, what that means is if they take on a position, maybe in a synthetic transaction where a client wants to buy a, buy a stock, but the client doesn't want to actually take that position on themselves, they're happy to get the economic exposure of it, but they don't want to have the capital outlay for that. The bank can take that position. And so long as they have an offsetting uh, contract with their clients so that the economic impact of the performance of that asset affects the client and not the bank, then the bank can actually do that activity. So that's, that's what they mean. Or if they're just acting as, a, uh, as an intermediary to the transaction, so they buy a stock from a client and sell it to a, a, another client, 
again, that's a, a client facility. Olga, you've asked the question about whether there's a, a cap on proprietary trading for banks. As I said, it's really more about what kind of appetite do the banks have for proprietary trading? And that's pretty low because they have better uses of, of capital because it's expensive. But I can bring up a chart next week. I don't have it to hand today where it was done in a couple of years afterwards, after the, uh, the, the Lehman default. And you can see that there's an eightfold difference in the size of proprietary trading by banks or the amount of capital and effective asset purchase power of the assets that banks made or applied to the business. So what you're talking about it, is it going from literally a huge part of the trading business to a, a, a mere shadow of its former self, but I'll get those statistics out and I'll show it in next week's slide or maybe interim this week. I'm sort of toying with the idea of doing a midweek video. So I might do that, but Olga, I will get your answer, but there's no question that the business was impacted by this removal of proprietary trading by banks. In fact, the business before the Lehman default and ever since there's about a 50% drop in value outstanding. So there's about $4 trillion of securities borrowed before Lehman at its peak. And since then, it's only reached $2 trillion. Now, there's a little bit of a skew on that because a big proportion of business that used to be done in the cash markets is now being done synthetically. So the true short economic exposure is bigger, but without a doubt in the cash markets, there's a big difference. So I'm glad that answered you. As I said, banks can do proprietary trading, but effectively don't. It's caused about a 50% drop in the business volume. And so that's obviously had a big impact. And that's what regulators intended. You, you need to be very clear. That was their goal. They wanted economic expo exposure for the banks that they had to bail out to be dependent on market activity. So when we saw the market crash last year in February and March, banks weren't really impacted anywhere near to the same extent that they were in 2008. And in fact, the reality is the volume of trading activity uh, that was generated during the crash, in fact, made money for banks. It's a, a very different situation than we were in 10, 12 years ago. So that's part one. Part two is the standardization of capital treatment for agent lenders. So if you recall in the risk sessions that I did, some agent lenders provide uh, effectively insurance policy. Banks don't like it when you call it that, but it's effectively an insurance policy that says, if the counterparty goes out of business the way that Lehman Brothers did, and we sell your collateral, and there's a shortfall when we're trying to buy back the securities that we had loaned out to the defaulting entity, we, your agent lender, will make up the difference. So you get back to the position you would have been in had you not been doing lending at all. Now, Different agents are located in different jurisdictions. They have different regulators. And so the capital treatment by those regulators varied in many parts of the world. So part of the rules of Basel III is to make it very clear that they want to have standardization of treatment from capital and risk management perspectives so that you can compare banks in different countries, banks that are regulated by different people. You have a more side-by-side -side view that is, that's a little bit more equal and a level playing field. The impact of that for many of the agent lenders though, is that it made their indemnification capital related costs go up. Okay. So it's a, a very individual bank or individual agent by agent variation. But all that happened is either it stayed the same in terms of cost to provide that, or it became more expensive because you had to put more capital aside for that. Okay, so that's the impact of that regulation. If we then, okay. So that's, we've done financial transaction tax, Basel III and Dodd-Frank Act. So that's three of the five we're doing today. Now we're going to do the, or talk about the central securities depositories regulation. Hopefully you guys are liking this. If you are enjoying this program, give us a thumbs up because we like to see thumbs and it helps me buy coffees. Not really. I just thought I'd say that. So CSDR, 
again, this is another regulation and what is a pattern. Most of these regulations aren't specifically for securities finance activity or any particular aspect of the market. These tend to be wide sweeping regulations where certain aspects of it will relate to this business. It started off with the first of the regulations being implemented in 2014, and there are rollouts until 2022, maybe even 2023. I've seen a couple of different versions of that, but certainly it's quite an extended program with multiple phases of implementation. Now, the key thing from a securities lending point of view is related to failed trades. So failed trade, again, for those of you that are clear on that is I have sold something to someone else and for whatever reason, I haven't delivered it to them. I've sold them a stock or a bond and I haven't delivered it to them. It means I haven't got my money, but more importantly, from a risk point of view, they haven't got the securities and they bought them fair and square. They are entitled to do that. In fact, from an accounting point of view, as soon as they do a trade with me, they have to start accounting for it as if it's uh, in their profitability calculations already, because it is. And so if I never deliver those securities because I'm supposed to deliver it today, but I go out of business and I never deliver it to them, then that's a problem for them. So it has a problem. Imagine if they sold it to someone else for a profit, they could never book their profit. And now my failure to deliver to them is not just a problem between the two of us, it's now a problem for another party who will also never get those securities. So the importance of reducing fails can't be underestimated. And in its most stock exchanges, there's a mechanism that says, if after a certain period of time, a seller hasn't delivered to a buyer, the stock exchange will force that seller to buy again in that market at penalty rates, effectively. It's called a buy-in. And so that exists because most equities trade on a recognized exchange and most exchanges have these rules. So the problem though, is that for most fixed income markets, there isn't an equivalent market. They trade what we call over the counter. So bilaterally between buyers and sellers. And so there isn't a mechanism to implement an equivalent penalty. And what the European uh, Union regulators have suggested is that the settlement venues implement mandatory buy-ins, okay? So what that means is if I'm supposed to deliver a bond to you and I haven't done it uh, in time and I I'm given a certain grace period to rectify it, and if I still don't do it, then I will be penalized. So that's the problem. The penalty then comes into me. Now that makes sense, right? If you just look at it on the face of it, it makes sense to put penalties in place to encourage people to satisfy their obligations. The way that they would do that is either satisfy the actual trade. So if I, again, if I sell you a bond uh, and I don't have it, what I could do is I can borrow it from somebody else and give it to you. So then at least your side of the transaction is solved. And now I just have to worry about getting the bonds back so I can pay back my loan. And again, securities lending is a very big part of the uh, fail management pro. So that makes sense. So what's the problem? Imagine I'm a borrower. I borrowed these bonds to deliver to you. And then whoever I borrowed them from asked to get them back from me. And I can't buy, I can't find anyone to lend it to me so I can return it. I can't buy them in the market. And all of a sudden I have a fail. And the reason someone asked me for that bond back is because they've sold it. So Matt, I'm sorry about that. I think I just hit the microphone. So imagine they've just sold the, the bond and they're waiting for me to give it back to them so that they can satisfy their, if I don't, if I can't find it and I can't do that, then because we don't have a market trade then they have a they have an economic claim on me through my securities lending agreement, but they'll be the ones that get bought in on the market. They'll be the ones that get the penalty. And even if we agree that I'm responsible for the costs of those penalties, then we have an issue. So they've recalled me on time. They say, Roy, I recalled you. You're contractually obliged 
to give that bond back to me in time, but you failed to do that. Therefore, any associated costs related to that, you're going to have to bear the cost. And that makes sense. In fact, contractually, I have to do that. Now, the issue is that's one side of it, but practically, as far as the market is concerned, it's whoever I borrowed the bond from that ends up with the market penalty. Now, market penalties damage your reputation. And so this investor that loaned me the bond that now has a reputational issue, they might just say, you know what? I make money out of securities lending, but not enough money to avoid or to be willing to take uh, reputational damage. So I'm just going to stop lending. And if they stop lending, then that has an impact on the liquidity of the markets. And so the concern is that investors that end up being penalized, even if it doesn't cost them economically, they may withdraw from the market. And the argument made by market participants and their trade associations is that there are already economic or so financial arrangements in place that says if that lender has failed to deliver to a buyer and the buyer feels that feels aggrieved by that, they can sort it out between themselves economically. There is a claims process there that says we can already do that. And so the trade associations have been arguing that we already have a mechanism in place that solves for this. We don't need this new onerous requirement that might create a situation where some investors stop participating in the market and make the markets. Now, there's a couple of questions here about failed trades. In theory, if there's no buy-in requirement, failed trades can go on forever in theory. That's why most markets on the equity side have very specific guidelines. So again, we talked about this in last week's uh, session on the US and the short selling regulation reg show, which talks about Normal settlement date is T plus two. If by the morning of trade day plus four, the shares haven't been delivered, there's an automatic buy-in that's executed. But that will vary market by market. And as I said, in over-the-counter markets, there is no buy-in limit there so that you can have failed trades that last for days or months or theoretically forever. But of course, you, you do have business relationships and you say, I'm going to stop trading with you and you look for other sanctions, other ways to get back to them. So fails get resolved. Usually if you have a longstanding fail trade, it's because the size of it is so small that economically not worth your while to sort it out because you, you'll never get around to it. So that's the issue. So we have an issue where the trade associations have been lobbying for some time saying this is unnecessary. We've had the regulator who said, no, this is going to be implemented. I'll get ready to do it. It's been delayed a couple of times because of COVID and it's supposed to be implemented in, in February of 2022. So less than, uh, less than a year away, uh, whatever that is, seven months away. Now, the good news is that the European Commission has agreed that they're going to review this aspect of the CSDR regulations. And within the last couple of weeks, the EC has said that. And the trade associations have responded again, saying, we're glad you're going to review this. We'd be happy to engage with you and make our position more clear. I think we'll have progress on that. Whether the mandatory buy-ins get dropped or not, that's up to the regulators. And that'll be at some point in the future. Okay. Keep an eye on that. I'm just going to flash up again, because I've had someone send me a private message. This is where you would uh, go to download the slides. Again, remember on any of the slides that I've been doing in any of these presentations, this is for information purposes and entertainment purposes only. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a tax advisor. I'm not a regulatory advisor. I'm definitely not a lawyer. So always take professional advice before taking any action. But of course you can go there download the slides. We'll actually send you the full set of slides this week. And good news on CSDR, potentially that at least the regulator's willing to talk. So I'm now going to do my obligatory Coke pause so that my throat can keep, keep functioning. Thanks uh, everyone for your indulgence there. Right. Now let's go to the big one. This is the big regulation, the Securities Finance Transactions Reporting Regulation. Now, I'm only going to, this is a huge topic. 
I'm only going to talk about this very briefly. I will, I promise you, I will make another video about this specifically. So this is just to give you an overview of uh, the regulations and what it's for. It's important to understand that this about that. I, I hope you are all still with me. I've been told that I've been sent a message which I haven't had. I've been doing live streams since December and I've just seen a message that I haven't seen before. So hopefully you're all still connected with me. If you're not, always check out the YouTube video because I'm going to carry on recording this and hopefully it will, you'll be there. So if you're still there, can you do me a favor and put a, a comment in just so I know that you are still here and still connected or whether I'm just doing this for the recording. Now, as I said, SFTR is a big regulation. I've put, thanks Olga, appreciate that. I don't know what happened, but I got the weirdest message. Now, this is an EU regulation and it was implemented, I guess, a little bit after it went live, a little bit after the UK withdrew from the EU. So nevertheless, the UK is still following on with SFTR regulations. Hey, JP, thank, thanks for confirming that, mate. Much appreciated. Hope, hope you're keeping well. SFTR, the UK is continuing on with that. There are starting to be a few differences between the EU version of SFTR reporting and the UK version of SFTR reporting, which makes it a little bit more complex. Now, we aren't going to go into the infrastructure required for this. That will be part of the separate video because it's not just about market participants. They use third parties to do reconciliations for them and act as intermediaries to give information to trade repositories. And it's actually trade repositories who give the information to the regulators. So it's quite a long chain here, which we won't go into, but there's lots of different pieces. And so this kind of Brexit version or UK version and EU version causes problems for all problems are there to be solved. So first of all, who does it cover? Well, it covers EU and UK entities doing repo, securities lending, any of the securities finance transaction regulations, including commodities. A lot of people don't know this, but there's been a gold lending market for you know, more than a hundred years. People just aren't aware of it. So EU and UK entities, but also non-UK or non-EU entities if the trades are done through an EU entity. So as an example, a typical structure for someone in securities lending is they might have their North American trading booked to a US or a Canadian entity or both a Canadian and a US entity. So they'll so the domestic US business will be booked in the US they might also do the Canadian business through that same entity. But then often you'll see all of the international business, whether it's Asian or European or African, you'll see the rest of the business booked into a European entity, either in the UK or somewhere in the continent. And so what this means is that those entities, all of those trades will be captured. Even if I'm a US entity, if I'm booking trades through my UK subsidiary or my European subsidiary, those trades will be captured. Okay. Now that's who it covers. Why is, does this regulation exist? I'd say I'm not really certain. I'll be completely honest with you. Regulate what it provides regulators with is all of the trading related activity for all of those securities finance transactions for all of the captured entities. So they have loads of information. It's not just the trades though. It's also any changes to those trades. So you don't just, you don't just report it on the day you do the trade. You report it every time there's what we call a life cycle change event. So the value might change or the collateral might change, uh, or there might be a corporate action. You have to report this on a regular basis every day. And so the regulators have a huge amount of data. And I think that they'll be able to take this data and look for roadblocks. So is there something gumming up the financial markets activity? Is there concentration risk? Is everyone trading a specific asset? Is there something we should be worried about there? 
or are there systemic risks that we should be aware of? Can we look for patterns that might identify problems? So I think all of those things are in theory what they're looking for. I'm not convinced that that's actually happening. And the interesting thing here is that this all goes, although we talk about one European regulator, ESMA, the reality is it gets implemented in each local jurisdiction. So Dutch banks provide it to the Dutch regulators, French banks to the French, Germans to the German. Each national regulator gets the data from their providers. And so when you have 27 and 28, including the UK, when you have 28 different countries interpreting the data, you will have some that are right on top of it and really examining the data in great depth and no doubt applying some of these risk checks. And you have some that are less engaged, less experienced, and there's probably less volume in those countries. So you, it's hard to really say. And since the regulators are keeping this information to themselves, it's who knows. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. I've said there's two winners out of this. Number one is the uh, companies themselves that are reporting this data because firms, as it says in the final point there, they have to report the details of all of their transactions and the financing sources and their collateral usage and sourcing. So they have to provide huge amounts of information. Now to do that, they've had to go through a huge amount of analysis internally themselves. So market participants, I guarantee you all understand more about their business today than they did before the regulations. So to me, that's the biggest value that it's generated so far. Firms have a better understanding of their business. Regulators might have a better understanding of the business, but the other winners, of course, are supercomputer salespeople who've been selling supercomputers to central banks and regulators so that they can go through this huge data and hopefully source it. So that's my little two winners, including supercomputer sales, but there you go. In any case, as the picture shows, there's a tremendous amount of paperwork that's been involved in implementing this and running it on a daily basis. In fact, what I haven't told you, in fact, is that it's been, it got implemented a, a year ago. So it's been running live for about a year and it's due for a review at some point. Now, the, the second part, a little bit more detail, new transactions than any of these life cycle events, like I was talking about with respect to corporate actions, any CCP central counterparty margining that has to go on collateral usage and it's counterparty loan collateral. There's, depending on the transaction type, there are as, much, as many as 130 plus fields of information get, that get reported on each transaction every day, okay, by every counterparty and both sides if they're captured. So it is, a, it is to say it's an enormous amount of reporting and a huge reporting burden would still be to underestimate it. Now, the as I, as I make in the final point there, the note is that this is between the principles. And if you remember in the structure videos that we've done on this, most investors use an agent to act on their behalf. And that agent then deals with the uh, prime broker who's probably a principal intermediary themselves for their hedge funds. So from an investor point of view, they don't really get involved with the trading in most play, in most cases. So what they can do is they can outsource it to their agent. Uh, and while the agent can do the work, it doesn't remove the responsibility from the investor. The investor is the one with the regulatory obligation to report that information and they can hire someone to do it on their behalf, but they keep the responsibility for it. And that's a, a really important point. So the bottom line of all of this is that uh, this is creating a tremendous wall of data uh, that's being shipped uh, back and forth every single day by everyone involved in the business. Okay. The, there hasn't been a regulation since I've been involved in this business that's had a more fundamental impact than this one. Now, interestingly, with what was going on in the US uh, as a result of uh, GameStop, and the other meme stocks earlier this year, what you, what is some people in the U S are saying, Hey, we like this idea of what the Europeans have done with the reporting of information. Maybe we'll make it a requirement for the U S that's a possibility. We have to watch this space, but look that that's a big, that's a big challenge and don't underestimate the amount of work. Now, what I will say is that 
for SFTR implementation, it's probably the smoothest regulatory implementation that we've seen over the last decade. And there've been many new regulatory implementations over that time. And a big part of that, you have to give credit to the trade associations for the securities lending industry and for the repo business and the derivative businesses, all of them, they were very actively engaged with their members and they took a real leadership role. So very much hats off to them for the work that they did uh, there. But again, watch for, uh, watch for more on SFTR in a separate video. And look, if you just generally want to learn more, we do a free pro on securities lending. So you can just do that anytime. As I say, that's free. Let me get rid of that caption so you can, in fact, see what, what the website is. So just go to our website and go to courses and you'll be able to access the free primer. So that's 50 minutes on securities lending, just from a, a 30,000 foot level. And of course, we also have the introduction to securities lending course. We also have repo courses and collateral management courses. So again, those are paid courses. They give continuing professional development. Uh, credits and they're online on demand. So you can do them at your convenience. The other thing I'd say is there's also a free primer for repo if you're interested in learning about repo, but for all of the courses, you can just go to our, our website and learn more. That's just, we're nearing the end here. So thanks for bearing with me. If you're still here, we talked about five regulations here, financial transaction tax. It has an, a financial impact on markets where it applies. That, re, that has shown to be the case that it reduces trading activity and that reduced trading activity reduces shorting activity and that shorting activity undermines securities lending revenue. That's just a fact. That's not a judgment on the implementation of the regulation or the tax. It's just factually correct. For Basel III and the Dodd-Frank Act, it's reduced the trading volumes from proprietary trading from banks, and it's also leveled the playing field for most market participants. And that's certainly, the latter part is certainly a good thing. Arguably, many people think that the reduction in proprietary trading by banks is also a risk reduction exercise. I'm not convinced I agree with that because the, most of the banks that needed to be bailed out were bailed out because of their activity in mortgages and retail financing or access to cash markets, not because of bad trading, but that's a story for another day. The CSDR, the key takeaway there is that if mandatory buy-ins are implemented, that potentially has a negative impact on the market in future if it gets implemented in February 2022, but there's discussions beforehand, so there may be adjustments, amendments, delays, or not to that regulation. So just keep an eye on that one. And for the Securities Finance Transactions Reporting Regulation, it's a huge reporting obligation, but it has provided unique insights for market participants and may do so for regulators as well. Next week, as I said, we're going to be talking about securities lending in times of crisis, and please join me for that one. Weirdly, securities lending, having your assets on loan can be a really good thing at the time a market is in a crisis. So I'm going to explore that then. In fact, I have in the past recommended that as countries move towards potential chaos, that investors aggressively loan out their portfolios as a protection measure. So you might want to stick with me for, for that one. I think that could be, I think that could be interesting. It could be interesting. Whoever just gave me the kind words of another awesome podcast on, on LinkedIn. Let me just show you that. There it is. Someone on LinkedIn. I love you. <laughs> Look, I love all the viewers, but I appreciate the message. But anyway, next week, join me again. Look at the fundamental playlist. Olga, I'm glad uh, you found value in it. So thanks again. Watch the playlist. Send me ideas on things that you want me to cover as well. I can talk about securities lending forever, but what I'm really here to do is answer questions that you have. The YouTube, if you want to go, I'll just one more minute and I'll just put up my YouTube link. Here is the YouTube channel, which is YouTube and then user and then Zimro1. So that's a YouTube link and that's it for me. I hope you guys have a great rest of the weekend. And if you're watching on replay, I hope you found this useful, but thanks very much everyone and over and out. Catch you next time.